Good morning. Nice to see you again. And thank you for coming. Today, I'm going to remind you of some of the details of the assignment that is due tonight before the end of the day. And then I will introduce the next digital app, DocuWiki. With DocuWiki, we are going back to the golden age of wikis, when wiki was, was the keyword for new technologies, new digital technologies for the handling of knowledge. We're going back to a period, the end of the 1990s, the 2000s, when dozens and dozens of wiki software were created. And now the terminology, the label of wiki is falling out of fashion, although Notion still uses it. And uh, the apps are all still about knowledge base apps, knowledge management apps, but basically we're still talking about the basic features remain the same from the golden era and DocuWiki is still being updated, although it, it is losing ground. I can see that. Um, and, and now, um, so I've prepared a series of screenshots uh, Sometimes I've installed and created and modified a wiki live in class, but of course, Murphy's Law, you never know what's going to happen. And so, for example, this morning I was trying to uh, modify the test wiki and the server was kind of slow, even though my domain is installed on a private, virtual private server with four gigabytes of RAM. But if if I'd been in class, I would have had to wait a minute or two for simple operations, so I cannot take that chance. Screenshots, are, the screenshots, as you'll see, are obsessively comprehensive. Every step is documented there. On Friday, then, between now and Friday, I will give each one of you access to a test wiki uh, created by me so that on Friday, you can go on your browser and you can do that even from your phone. You don't have to use a tablet or a uh, laptop. A smartphone will be sufficient. Anything with a browser will be sufficient. We'll start experimenting with the creation of a page. And as you know, between now and three weeks from now, two and a half weeks from now, plus the spring break, you'll have the last digital assignment which, is, which will be to create a page to showcase some of the features in DocuWiki. As far as the assignment is concerned, you find the instructions at the end of week six, right? Go back up, this is where you find it. If you haven't done so, there are still a few students who haven't sent me the uh, title of a YouTube video you want to work with, with me, just email me the link to the YouTube video to receive authorization to make sure that it's a proper uh, video. And before you do that, of course, check the page called the Evernote Experience to see the 30 or so videos that have already been selected by others. And this is the page. They are sorted, the titles in alphabetical order by the first word and underneath you find the link and you find the name of the person. As you can see in here, eventually what you're supposed to do by the end of the day today is to send me via email the shareable link to the Evernote page you created, which I will place here so technically, the page you create once you share the link becomes a public page. So keep that in mind. For example, I wouldn't put first name and last name. You can just put your first name and initial or don't put your name at all because you're associated with it anyway in here. So to protect your privacy, you can completely omit the name from there, but keep that in mind. So whenever you're ready, you just send me an email with the shareable link and I'll put it in here. How do you get the shareable link? Let me show you a note again. This is just a simple note I had created in the past. Let me 
make it bigger so you can follow. And you see on the top right corner, you click on share, and then you you have several options, such as invite someone. Do not invite me. I don't want to be invited to your page. I love you, but I don't love you that much. The issue would be that once you share that page with me, until you unshare it with me, it'll be in my notebook, in my Evernote forever and ever. And it's not what we need anyway because we are creating a public wiki about the Evernote experience. So this is the choice for you. Here, shareable link. When you access your page, it'll be disabled by default, of course. So you click on the button, you wait, because normally you see even now, it took a couple of seconds for the link to be reformulated because the permission is inscribed in the address. And now that it is reformulated and I can see anyone with the link can view, which is the default option. Now I click on copy link. I paste that link in an email to andrea.fedi at stonybrook.edu. And of course, once I receive your link, I send you a, a simple message, a simple response saying, thank you, you know that you've done your duty, that you are fine, that you submitted your assignment. And then later uh, this week and next week, I will review those pages and grade them and send you a grade via email, okay? Because of course I cannot modify the pages and those are public pages, so I wouldn't put my comments and the grade in those pages. And of course, nothing wrong if you shared the page with me, or if you're going to share the page with me, you will receive a different kind of response saying, please unshare it so that it's not crowding my Evernote, and instead send me a shareable link. That is what I showed you. Now you know what a shareable link is. You have three demo pages with about 80 to 90 screenshots each that show you the entire process. The first part of this demo is just for your knowledge or your curiosity. That is to say, the first part is not something that you have to learn, practice, or redo. <laughs> because you're not going, even if you pick DocuWiki for your final project, you're not going to install it. <laughs> you, if you pick DocuWiki, you let me know and then you simply use the space that will be created for your assignment as the space for your wiki. That is to say, you will develop the wiki within the um, uh, space that is allocated with you, okay? And uh, we can make it public, it's your preference. You, we can make that, that wiki you create public or we can keep it private and only you and I will be able to access it. But you'll have to let me know because I'll be the, the, the top level manager, administrator of the wiki. But I included the installation process exactly because it brings you back, it shows you what was the norm um, up until 10 or 12 years ago, what part of the process uh, you had to go through in order to be able to operate a wiki. And the operation of the wiki itself is very easy. The installation, it's a bit more cumbersome, but again, even uh, users who were not technically savvy would simply follow a tutorial and do it. At this point, some uh, companies hosting uh, space on their servers will have a one-click installation. So that tells you that DocuWiki is still somewhat popular. For example, I use DreamHost, um, and DreamHost is one of the companies that will have a one-click installation, meaning you select that and they will install the server for you, the, the software on the server for you and give you the key, give you the access code, and then you just start creating pages, which is the fun part and the easier part. But I want to show you everything 
because it is also part of history and it starts like that now some of the images uh, of course these are screenshots may not be fully clear in all the details from the seat where you are but at home you can review them if you want to and what is the first step for the installation of wiki software of this kind and it's not unique as i said there are still a few dozen similar uh, kinds of software which is what survives out of a larger number of wiki apps you need some kind of utility that will allow you to upload of course you need space on a server right whether it's free or pay you need space on a server or you need to turn your own computer into a server and then you need some kind of utility to upload your software onto that server. I use FileZilla, which is free and runs on a variety of platforms. So this is what you start with. You open FileZilla and you have on one side the files on your computer and the other side is empty because we haven't connected to a server yet. But before you can install the software, you need to have this installed and you need to connect in order to connect to the server. You need to know the host name, your username, your password, the port. And of course, I don't have to do all of this because I can just go back to a profile in the memory of the software that is already configured in the software and I launch it, I select the correct set of credentials for the login and once I select that you see that this is the history of what is being done by FileZilla in order to connect to that particular server and one that is completed you see on this side, let me move the cursor You see on this side that I have andreafedi.com and another folder, the default folder with all the log information for the activities of this particular domain. And once I click on Andrea Fedi, then of course, since I've clicked on the root directory, I have all the folders and the files in the root directory, and I have the first set of the subfolders in my domain. I have about 60 gigabytes of stuff for current courses, courses that I've taught in the past. I put stuff there, but I never remove, rarely remove something. And again, this is more folders. And so, the next thing I need to do is, of course, create a directory where I want to install my wiki. I don't want the wiki to shield and overlap with the whole um, domain. I don't want it to install it in the root directory. I create a separate directory, still using FileZilla. I give it a name in this case this is the process for the installation of the wiki test 2020 that i used in fall of 2020 the last time this class was offered and now i have once i complete this process i have in small letters of course i have wiki test 2020 in here in alphabetical order as an option And when I select that, I see that it is empty and it's ready. So I can now gather the files that I want to install. So I go to docuwiki.org, which is the official website of the software, which is free. And also where I find the forums where users discuss their issue. And this is the first page. And the first thing you can notice that this page itself is done with DocuWiki, right? And right the, 
you, you see, for example, uh, the, the usual format for, for this kind of software <coughs> is that external, the default template, the default style is that external links are in blue, internal links are in green. You have a sidebar, which is very common, and you have the breadcrumbs. It's tracing your traffic. So the more pages you visit and the more links will be here, this, is, can, this can be configured to be limited to three, five, or as many as you want. I don't know what the limit is, 15, 20. So that instead of using backs, I can click on the breadcrumbs, like, like in the fairy tales, right? <laughs> and go back to right away to where I want to be. And of course, I can click on download to get the files. However, it's not one of those buttons that prompts the download right away. Because after I click that, I have a download page with three columns. Before I hit download, I have to select the version, select the languages for the interface or interfaces, and I have the option of adding to the package some of the most popular plugins because all wiki software of this kind can benefit a lot from the plugins so the the, the simple the, the bare bone software is not as powerful uh, without those plugins that allow you to add features and the plugins themselves are built created by a community of software programmers and then made available to the community. And usually it's more than one person because someone will write some software, someone else, since it is open source, will take it, modify it, um, enhance it, and, and add their name to it. Okay, so before we, down, we click download, we prepare our choices. So as far as the version, you can select an older version if you want to because you have a plugin that only works with that version. Even plugins need to be updated from version to version. You can click the most recent stable version of the software. And at this point, it is still Hogfather from July 2020, the most recent version. Uh, we're, we're expecting in a matter of months the newest version, but has not come out yet or you can find here the most recent beta version, right? So the development of uh, software, if, if you like, uh, like uh, living on the edge. Of course, this would be more recent, this goes back. Second column, you can select one or more languages for the interface. These translations were provided by the community of users. As I said before, uh, you can toggle all of them and then English will be always enabled. And then from there, you can add English and another language if you want to switch and have multiple templates within the same wiki. But that would be a small number, a niche uh, amount of users. And the popular plugins are, for example, Upgrade, which will allow you to upgrade to the newest system without having to go through this process again just by clicking on the button, even though it's a bit more involved, the process. Wrap plugin is something I also have. Introduces fancier formatting styles because the basic formatting styles are quite limited. Um, I wouldn't put translation, but video share plugin is certainly beneficial because it allows you to embed a YouTube video with very simple code the same way that we embedded it in Notion or Evernote. So these are the selections, right? Stable version, just English, upgrade, wrap, and video share. Oh, gallery plugin for the pictures. So you can have a slideshow. You can move from picture to picture just by clicking. This is how many languages there are, and more are being added with new users. And at that point, you click on download and you download this package that was prepared for you, but the package is compressed, right? It's a tarball, it's a TGZ file, and then you have to save it to your computer. You have to uh, 
put it in a folder, you have to extract the files, right? And after you complete the extractions, you go back, boy, I really included every single screenshot, so I'll skip a few. You go back to FileZilla, you select the directory where you have <coughs> placed the extracted file. These are all the files of the installation. You see there is install PHP because the installation, the software relies a lot on PHP. That is to say, the pages you see as the end result of the wiki are not HTML pages. They're text pages, TXT pages. <coughs> But how do you see a TXT page as a full-fledged formatted uh, website or, or HTML page? Simply because there is a PHP engine that on the fly, whenever you want to access a page, translates that page into an HTML page, okay? But basically it's all text as far as the content or PHP as far as the formatting engine with the help of some uh, CSS, the formatting style of HTML. So you have the files in the root directory here and a series of folders with more information. And now I have this on one side. I have the empty directory of Wikitest 2020 on the other side that I created. And I can simply initiate the upload. So I select everything. I right click and I do upload or I can drag everything there. And at this point, you have a process that will last for a couple of minutes. And this is partial uploading. Some of the folders are there, but you, you really have uh, several thousands of files that get uploaded. It's not big in terms of space, but the number of files it's, it is certainly quite big. Again, this is the whole process. At this point, everything has been copied. And at this point, now I have all the files on my server. And this is what I need to run. I need to run the install. Only this file, this executable file for the installation is not on my computer. So I need to access it from the browser. So I click on this, I get its address, the exact address, right? You see here, after I clicked, I right clicked and selected copy URL to clipboard. And then I go back to my browser I paste the address there, but it's not sufficient. Of course, as you see, the address is not an HTTP address. It's an FTP address because it's in the language, in the codification of server places. So I need to change FTP into HTTP or HTTPS if you have a site with a certificate. And then I need to get rid of the username and just keep the last part, andreafedi.com, wikitest2020, which is the folder. And finally, the name of the installation file, which is install.php. Now, keep in mind that at this point, for a matter of a minute or so, until the installation is complete, and really it's very quick, but at this point, Anyone could hijack your wiki. Anyone with that address could install the wiki with their credentials as managers, which is why once we complete the installation, we remove the install file from the server. Right? Otherwise, your, your wiki could be overwritten. So you modify everything, you run the file, and all the most difficult parts at this point are practically over. Once you run the install file, file you see, still install PHP, you get a simple questionnaire. You have to 
provide the following information. You put here your wiki name and you have to think carefully uh, about uh, the wiki name because after you put a name there, it's almost impossible to change it. If you try to change it in a straightforward way, more often than not, you'll mess with your wiki. You will not be able to find the pages. Enable ECL means that you want to regulate access to the pages. So you want to have rules enforced such that, for example, you can say everyone can read this page, but not everyone can read these other pages. Or some people can read and modify this page. Other people can read, modify, and delete a page or create a new page, etc. You can set the privileges. So clearly anyone will want to enable ACL. You don't want your wiki to be uh, free for everyone. And you have to be careful about security. I was thinking that it's now maybe eight years ago that one of my wikis for a class on the history of Italian language was hijacked. Uh, and uh, they added pages to it. I didn't realize because there were some hidden pages hidden from view. They were not linked. The content was about food cream and uh, fungus, right? Things that would uh, get a lot of hits and searches. But then all the links and provide some information about what, is fung what are fungi, uh, what kind of creams can be used. But whenever there was a link, if you clicked on the link, you would be taken to uh, a, a website, a malicious website with Trojan viruses, etc. Of course, I was the super user who it was simple for me to, I was still in control of the whole wiki, it was simple for me to revoke authorization to the people who had entered and to eliminate those pages. Uh, the problem in that case was that I forgot to disable anyone can register as a user. So it was simple for them to, to enter, to add to the wiki. So you put your super username, meaning it's a username. It just means that you're the manager of the wiki. And that username will be associated with the highest level of rights over the configuration of the wiki. You add your real name, you add your email. Of course, the email is important because if, if you forget the password, the password will be sent, a new password will be generated and sent to that address. You add the password, you repeat the password, and you set the access policy. So initially, since this was a test, uh, you can specify read, write, upload for everyone or limit that. It, it depends on how much you care about the content. If it is the web sp a, a, a test site, you can say, I, I can simply reformat the ser that area of the server, delete that folder and proceed. And you select also the copyrights you want associated with that. So in here you see I gave the wiki the name 2020. I selected attribution share alike international. I put Andrea underscore 2020 as the super user name. Added my real name, my Stony Brook email account password repeated the password I changed the initial ACL policy to public wiki read for everyone write and upload for registered users which would be the students as you will be able to do by Friday and selected the attribution non-commercial and of course if you want to know more about what kind of rights you're giving over your content with this kind of copyright license you are implicitly you are declaring that and this will be marked on every page by default that you allow people to copy and redistribute the material in any minimum format you are giving the permission to transform or remix the material, but attribution has to be given to you. People have to give you credit.
which is fine for intellectual content, right? You, you, you're not particular, not going to sell the content of my classes if anyone wants to reuse them, fine, as long as they say, I was the creator. So at this point, I can save that information. Of course, I need to store the password in a safe place. And once I save, just the time to fill up that information. Once I save instantly, it doesn't take more than a second or two. Instantly I have this. The configuration was finished successfully. You may delete the install PHP file now. You must delete the install. Otherwise, someone can overwrite your wiki. No permission necessary. And then you see there is continue to, to a new docuwiki. And this is when you link this is what you find. It's a default page, right? That gives you some information. Congratulations, your wiki is up and running. There is a table of content, which is standard, the default for this template. And then it tells you that you should create new pages. And you see there are red words with a dotted underline. That is the default style for new pages, because in order to create a new page, it's similar as a process to Notion. It's Notion that borrowed from these models. In order to create a new page, you create a link to a page that doesn't exist. And you click on it, you put content, you give it a title, and then what was read before becomes a green link with the title that you put, that you gave that page, right? So some simple instructions, but now you're ready to create and modify a page. This is everything, including information about the forums that you find there. And when you click on the start link, right, which would be your portal, your homepage, you have this, which is typical of DocuWiki and similar software, similar kinds of software. This topic does not exist yet because you haven't created this page. And however, on the sidebar, on the other side, you just see buttons that will allow you to go back, see backlinks, see the history of the page, and see the code in the page, but you cannot do anything to the page itself. Why? Because as you see, log in, you need to log into the page as an authorized user in order to modify that. So you click on login, <coughs> And this is the simple login process, which from this point on, everything you see is of interest to you in a direct way because you have to do the same on Friday or when you work on this for your digital assignment. You go to the wiki where you have editing rights, you click login on the top right corner, and then you enter the username assigned to you, the password assigned to you, and of course I'll share that individually with you and then you can log in but keep in mind that you also have the option of clicking remember me if you're using a device that your own is your own device for easier login the next time around and if you forget your password you can click set new password and the password will be reset the server will generate a new password sent to the email with which you were registered so, of course, I want to click Remember Me for quicker access. Once I click that, you see that Login has transformed into Logout, and you see that the first three symbols from the bottom are the same. Go to the top, backlinks, history of the page. But now I have a different icon here with a crayon and a plus. A crayon and a plus means if you click here, you can add to this page. You can actually create to this cre create this page. So I click, and it says create this page. Later, after I create the, the page, instead of the crayon with the plus, I'll just have the crayon, and it will say edit the page. So I click on create this page, and this is what I have. I have a, an applet. Now, the applet you see here can be modified 
it depends on the plugins. So here you have some formatting option, right? Bold, italics, underlined, uh, mono type, strike through, headline one, and different levels of headlines, add a link, inside link, internal link, external link, numbered list, bulleted list, uh, I don't remember what this is, uh, and uh, add a picture, add an emoji, add a symbol, uh, and add a package, but this is for, for programming inside the page, add a video, etc. But as I said, this can include more buttons depending on the plugins that you add, but it's kind of the same applet that you might find in Blackboards or other kinds of server-side software where you have a box for editing where you just type and add a few codes and then you can save it and it's published to the internet. You can preview it and then you see it within this page but it's not public yet or you can cancel to exit without doing anything. And of course, keep in mind that you do have versioning. You have the page history that allows you, in case you accidentally delete a portion of a page, allows you to go back to a previous version of the page. Keep in mind that whatever you do on this page, when you save, it is not saved on your local computer. It is being saved on a server. In my case, for DreamHost will be probably a server in Texas. Used to be California and probably now they've moved to Texas knowing the trends with these companies. This is important to keep in mind because depending on the speed of your connection, you don't want to write a few things, hit save, write a few things, hit save, because you can cross messages. That is to say, you may end up working on a page that is not being upgraded yet. Whenever you modify something and you save, it will take at least a handful of seconds for the changes to be placed on the server and become available to everyone, including you. So it's not good practice to save too often. However, for, for the safety of your operation, keep in mind that whenever you hit preview, a draft is saved. So you can go back to that draft if the connection is interrupted, the system will change the history icon into a different icon with a compass telling you that there is a draft that you may want to restore. At this point, you just write that with the addition of a few codes, it's all based on markdown, meaning I use some of the typo typographical symbols that I find on the keyboard to introduce code. So, of course, I want to give this page a title. In order to give a title, I have opening and closing tags, and these are equal signs. A title will be marked by six equal signs before and after. The code is somewhat tolerant, so you don't have to be so exact. If you put six equal signs in front and only five in the back, the browser will still read this as a title. The same happens with HTML. If you don't have the correct closing tags for some of the HTML code, browsers will intervene and correct that on the fly, okay? Of course, you want to have only one title. This is the title that will appear on the bar of your browser. And every other heading, of course, if this is H1 level, the next one will be five equal signs, including a subtitle, four, three, two. And two is the lowest level because one cannot be the code. This is based on the repetition, repeated use of these codes. So if you write type equal sign, the equal sign will appear. If you type two of them, then you are codifying a title. The main problem, the main issue, everything is easy to understand. The main issue is that if you don't put the closing tags for any kind of formatting, then the page gets messed up from that point on, right? Because there is no closing tag, so everything is interpreted incorrectly. Everything from that point on is interpreted differently from what you meant. So I put the title Portal of 2020, 
and then in order to add text, I just type, right? As simple as this, I just type, and if I hit save, this will be published on the internet. Notice, however, that I put a space between the title and the first block. You put spaces for two reasons. One is elegance and clarity, right? You don't want your code to be a jam because you want visually to see the blocks of code. And second reason, so this is not necessary, but it's useful, it's good practice. The other reason why you want to hit enter twice at the end of a block is that two carriage returns mark different blocks. If you just hit enter once and you continue on the next line, when you hit save, the page will show you the beginning of this line here as one paragraph, one block. So two carriage returns replaces what in HTML would have been P at the beginning of a paragraph and slash P at the end of a paragraph. So instead of having to put that there, you just separate blocks, separate paragraphs with blank lines. So once you write that and you hit save, this is what you have, right? You see right away and you see that the crayon with a plus has become just a crayon and you see that you have one more edit button. So you have two options now to re-enter the page and modify it. If you want to re-enter, edit the whole page, you click here. If you want to modify just one section, of course this doesn't have multiple sections, but if you want to modify just one section, you click edit so that you don't have to have in front of you a very long page and find where you want to make your change. You have less text and your, your intervention is quicker because the focus is on productivity, adding content, organizing content, formatting content in the simplest and most expeditious way. Okay, so if I open the page again, let me go to the next part, this is two. If I open the page again, as you see, I hit enter twice in order to add a second block. And I simply type, and anything I type, I hit save, hits and, and it's on, on the internet. This circa 2000, the year 2000 was a big thing, right? Not to have to download an HTML file from a server, modify it with HTML code, upload that file again in order to see it for every single small change. Now this is common practice, right? Notion, I write and it's there. Within a second or two, I don't even have to hit save with Notion or Evernote, right? Everything is done, everything I do is reflected in the servers in real time. But at, at this time, 15, 20 years ago, this was a big advancement in terms of flexibility and productivity. As usual, the ways I modify the formatting of this text, I have two ways, one is select and click a button. I select topics in digital technology and culture. If I hit the italic button, it gets italicized. However, everything is done with markdown, so I can just type. Because when I click the italics button, this is what happens after I select. The system has added a double slash in front and after. And this, once I save or hit preview, gets italicized. I could just type, right? And as I said, most professionals, digital professionals will be fast typists and will just type the code instead of grabbing the mouse, hitting the button, selecting the text, which is more time consuming. As I said before, if you were to forget the closing tags or just put one slash instead of two, then what would happen to this? When I hit save, what would be the result? of not putting the correct ending tag. Just the slash is still there. The slash would still be there, and what else? Would I see 
italicized text? No. Yes. Everything will be italicized from here to the end. Oh, okay. Because lacking the uh, proper closing tag, the next level is used, which is up to the end of the document. But this also means that if any title is formatting there, all the equal signs will be there. Everything will be treated as text, not code. So everything that was supposed to show something else will be italicized instead, and I have to find the mistake and correct it. The same way that, as I said before, if I don't put the correct number of equal signs there, the system will just take the end of this block as the terminus, as the place where the title ends. So I can select DocuWiki and I can click bold, the bold button, and two stars are used in this case for the markdown feature of make this bold, whatever is enclosed in two star buttons at the beginning and two star buttons at the end. And I didn't hit save, I hit preview. And you see when I hit preview, the box, the editing box is still there and I see what the page would look like. Of course, this is a preview of what your test looked like. It is not saved yet. If I leave the page, no changes will be made, but I can see now that topics in digital technology and culture is italicized. DocuWiki is now formatted in bold. And I continue, I press enter twice, and I can add more text. Let's look at links. How do you add links? Even links can just be typed. No code at all is necessary. If you start your link with www, anything will be interpreted as a clickable link. Of course, the downsides of this is that if you just opt for this format, the default will be the HTTP version of the web page rather than the HTTPS, the secure version of the page, and you want to be secure when you travel through the internet. And now when I hit preview, what I simply wrote as a link is clickable, no code at all. And again, 15 or 20 years ago, this was a big, uh, big advancement as opposed to having to write uh, in, in HTML, a href, and, and then the, the, the link, and then of course you need to put the label for the link, and A again, etc. This is much simpler. I type, and it's clickable, and links, internal and external, are essential to the development of a knowledge base, right? Now, of course, when I click on that link, I get transported there. I can also, of course, copy a link. In that case, I copied that link because links are mostly ugly to see, right? And most links are not so quick and easy. Let me get the tip out of the way. Okay. So, if I just copy a link from my browser, here I copied https slash uh, colon slash slash www.uwiki.org, then you see how I create a label for the link. I put two square brackets. Again, if I put one square bracket, it will be shown as text. Two will be interpreted as code for a link, internal or external. So two square brackets, the link, then I put a vertical bar, Whatever I put between the vertical bar and the closing brackets will be the clickable label that will take you to this link. And I wrote the official website of the DocuWiki community. When I save this, now instead of www.docuwiki, I see the phrase, and once again, it's clickable. It's in blue, that's the standard and you see the world in here, the icon with the world, meaning this will take you outside of the uh, wiki. 
Okay, and once again, this is what I did before. Other simple codes for hyphen placed at the beginning of a line with space in between will produce a horizontal line. And this is common even for docu even for Evernote or Notion, it might be three in, in other programs, three hyphen will automatically transform in a horizontal line. And of course, after I've separated blocks with lines, I put another uh, level and anything beneath under six will be a sub level, right? And I can organize it hierarchically for the table of contents. And I put the equal signs and I write a title, for example, formatting. Now, if I want to display the code for formatting, how can I show the code? Well, simply in order to show the code with Notion, you select uh, that from a menu. In here, you just put two blank spaces at the beginning of a line. Again, one space will be interpreted as text and shown as such. Two spaces at the beginning of a line will tell the system this has to be shown as it is rather than formatted and shown as formatting. So this is the result, right? DocuWiki had the two stars and it was formatted. This is part of a line that started with two blank spaces and therefore everything is shown literally, right? And this could extend, this box could extend for several lines. I can add other examples for italics, the slashes, for underline, the double underscore, and the box will show all the code for the user to see the same kind of code in another context would produce the formatting it shows, right? I can combine these codes, right? I can have something that is underlined, italicized, and formatted in bold. I just combine any of those three codes as long as I have opening and closing tags in the correct order. And I can write here some examples. And I can make this into a list. How can I make a bulleted list? Again, I start with two spaces, then one single star, and then a space. This will be transformed in a bullet. There is also automatic formatting, so after I write this, if I press enter, automatically I'll be brought here. That is to say, the editor will automatically add for the next item in the list, the two blank spaces, the star. And if I don't want this, because this is the end of my list, I just hit enter again, and that formatting disappears. That would be the example. Otherwise, I continue, and I can add more items until I'm done, and then I can show you the end result. I'll just jump to the list of examples. You see the bullets, and of course, everything you see here can be modified if you access the template itself. The system, the program comes with this default template, but there are hundreds of templates created by user, or you can open the template and change the font, change the size, change the space between this line and the bullets, change the shape of the bullet, if you're familiar with the uh, CSS style of HTML and you see now as I said before when I look at the buttons on the right side I see edit this page and not create this page anymore okay so I'll stop here and I'll continue another time. And of course, on Friday, we'll practice with a rudimentary page in DocuWiki after you receive proper access.